Okay, um, I think we might start because I'm, I'm always conscious this is people's time. Um, so Pamela, if you're okay, if we just, um, I'll uh, let people come in as they do. Um, but just to ask everyone if they can put their mics on mute um, and their video on mute also. Um, and you can ask some questions at the end. Unfortunately, we've lost our text box for some reason, but if you want to raise your hand and ask a question, um, please feel free at the end. And um, Pam would very kindly like to um, answer some, some questions. So Pam, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Pam Durant is the founder and managing director of Diapoint, um, and I'll obviously let Pam to talk us through uh, a little bit about Diapoint. Um, so today Pam is going to talk about a very important topic which is diabetes and your lifestyle and I think it's something that's very prevalent within uh, the region here in the UAE um, and something I know Pam is very passionate about. I know there's, there's lots of our staff in AES um, who are also very passionate about diabetes. Um, so Pam thank you so much for joining us today um, and I'll hand it over to you to tell us a little bit more. Thank you so much for having me today and thank you everyone for joining. Um, I really appreciate your interest in this topic. It is a, a subject I'm really passionate about and not something that I ever thought in my life that I would be. Um, but life leads us through different turns of events and different things. I'm by education and profession a healthcare manager and I've been working in the healthcare sector for about 30 years. About 25, no, 20 years into that, let's say, or slightly before, my son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And I was in a kind of a VIP meeting last week, and we were all going around the table. It was, everyone was in healthcare and introducing themselves. And I talked about all my credentials, but the really interesting thing for me about this journey was that I used to think I was a healthcare expert. And I really was never a healthcare expert until I had to manage a chronic condition in a 20 month old. My son's now 13, he'll be 14 in January. He's fine, he's growing up with type one diabetes and doing very well, but that's not to say that it's easy. It's very challenging, no matter what type of diabetes you have. Type one diabetes is autoimmune. Type two happens for many different reasons, sometimes genetic. Sometimes lifestyle, there's a lot of reasons for insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. I'm also a wellness and lifestyle medicine coach. Um, and I founded Diapoint in 2016. I left the corporate world and my healthcare consulting career to start this because I realized there was a very large gap between what happens when you're diagnosed and you go to your doctor and you go for checkups, but then after that, you're alone. And diabetes is something that is 24 seven, every day, all day, every year, nonstop. So a little bit more about what Diapoint does. As I mentioned, um, I'm a health and wellness coach and we have other health and wellness coaches as well, nutrition coaches. We do consulting also for clinics and hospitals and organizations about how to better coach their patients with diabetes because that's something that's really missing. Clinically, places are very good. But after the clinical stuff, diabetes is just as much psychosocial as it, as it is biological. Uh, we organize events. We do a lot of advocacy. This month, I've been very busy with that. And we also have an online shop where we sell services, but also products that are focused on health and wellness. It is my mission to really help people feel better about having diabetes. And one way through that is through coaching and having a very positive experience with it. Because when you look up diabetes, if you Google it, usually the images are very ugly and not very positive. And why are we here this month? Because November 14th was World Diabetes Day and November is World Diabetes Month. The reason it happens to fall on the 14th of November is because that is when the person or who, one of the researchers who, um, Sir Frederick Banting, who is from Canada, led the research to discover insulin. Today, not today, sorry, November 14th is his birthday. And this year was very special because it is the 100 year anniversary of insulin. We all know about the global burden of diabetes. Catherine mentioned it's really prevalent in the region, but not just in the region, it's prevalent throughout the world. Um, there's 
this perception, which is somewhat true that there is a, a huge population with diabetes here. Like for example, in the UAE, approximately 40% of the population have type two diabetes or insulin resistance, and that's just documented. But this region is not so different from so many other regions in the world. And all of these numbers that have been calculated, this was pre-COVID. Why is COVID significant? It's not because people with diabetes are high risk in COVID and what you read in the news. It's because we all went into lockdown. We all embraced Netflix much more. We all stopped going out and exercising. And now, fortunately, we're blessed to be in the UAE and we're active and we're going out and the weather's beautiful here. But with the recent turn of events in the news and a new variant coming out and nobody knows what the future is, we're not really doing the healthy things that we need to do to ward off chronic conditions like diabetes, like type 2 diabetes and other things. So I just want to ask everyone in your, you know, get you, you don't have to answer, and I'm sorry we lost the, the chat box here, but what image comes to your mind when you visualize diabetes? What do you see? Was it maybe something like this, one of these pictures? Maybe it's fast food. Maybe it's something genetic. Maybe it's a life of needles. Maybe it's someone overweight. Or there's the cartoon character in the top right, like the guy sitting on the couch. These are the typical images that we think of when we think of diabetes. Did anybody think of any of these people? If you did, raise your hand. All of the, the athletes and people and famous people, and this is just a small drop in the bucket. Oh, cool, okay, so Abigail raised her hand. She did, you did think of one of these people with diabetes. That makes me so happy. Most people typically don't think of these really great examples of pe people thriving with diabetes. Um, Holly Berry, she seems like she might have type 1, but she may have another kind of genetic form of diabetes that behaves like type 1. She's, she's really kind of discreet about her diabetes. Only recently, she seems to start talking about it more. Evita Leder is an Olympic swimmer from South America. She was in the Olympics in Brazil, type 1 diabetes. Sebastian Sasseville was the first type 1 to climb Mount Everest. Arthur Ashe had type 1. George Lucas, I love the story. He was um, drafted to the Vietnam War and they wouldn't let him go because he had diabetes. Diabetes gave us Star Wars. Sage Donnelly, she's a kayaker with diabetes. Eric Tozer, he's a um, ultra runner with diabetes. And Tom Hanks, he's pretty out, outspoken and shares a lot about his diabetes. So these are just some of the positive images of diabetes. And all of these people are living, are ha they're ones that are no longer with us, like Arthur Ashe, live life to the fullest. So why would that stop anybody else that has diabetes? I don't really share pictures of my son in my business at all, but I do share this one. This is my son. Um, one day after he got an insulin pump, he was about 22 months old in that picture. He was diagnosed at 20 months old. I share this because if any image is going to break the barrier of what diabetes looks like, this is the best one that I found. That is not your typical diabetes image that you will find just anywhere. This was a hard picture for me to take as a parent. I'll admit it. It was so hard. It was so challenging. I cried when I snapped this picture, but he was just, just a kid having fun in his grandparents' garden, watering the flowers. And there's no reason why we should carry around all these negative images of diabetes with us, if this is what diabetes looks like. Diabetes is every day, all day, as I mentioned before. There's a calculator on the internet, just to give you an idea of how much is all day, every day, if you don't live with diabetes or you don't love someone who has diabetes. My son's been living with it for probably more than 4,100 days now. 2,331 hours of sleep have been lost. I promise you it's much, much more than that. 
he's had at least 20,000 finger pricks to check his blood sugar. And this is using an insulin pump and his site has been changed. That insulin pump site has to be changed every three days with quite a long needle, at least 1,000, almost 1,400 times. This is not just a once a month thing. It's not just a one day a year discussion. It's something that we need to think about every day all the time. But what does it really mean? I've showed you these pictures of some glamorous people with diabetes. I've showed you a picture of a cute child with diabetes, but what really is diabetes? Because if you go to the internet and social media, there's a lot of misconceptions. Medically, clinically, diabetes is when you don't have enough of the hormone insulin in your body. We have to have insulin to survive. It's what turns our energy into food. Instead of turning it, it into energy, the glucose will stay in our blood if we don't have enough insulin or if our body can't produce insulin, and that will result in high blood sugar. In the case of type one diabetes, the body does not produce any insulin at all. At initial diagnosis, you may go through what's called a honeymoon phase. Your body will produce some insulin, but what happens is the immune system attacks your pancreas, the cells in your pancreas, kills them, and that organ can no longer function to make insulin. Type two, the body will make some insulin. Often pre-diabetes is an early insulin resistance takes a very long time to get to the point in type two when your body can no longer produce any insulin or enough insulin. And, and there is no transfer of like you're type two and now you're type one. They're, they're actually really two very separate clinical conditions, but they all involve the pancreas and they all come from the same Latin name. And so this is why they have a similar name. But in type two, the cells don't work as well as they should. And there's so many reasons for that. It's often associated with a poor lifestyle and being unhealthy, but that's not always the case. I've had people walk up to me that are very tiny, very healthy. I have a friend that's a marathon runner and he has insulin resistance because genetically his, his father had it and he inherited that and he manages it. So for, for one reason or another, our bodies are not producing enough insulin when we get type two. I always compare it to wearing glasses. Sometimes we need a little help and insulin is what gives us that, that help to, to digest our food properly. Type two may or may not be controlled with diet and exercise. And I wanna emphasize that because there is never any one size fits all. There are some things that are really clinically and scientifically proven that will help all types of diabetes. Um, one of those happens to be a plant-based diet. I'm not saying you should become a vegetarian, but what works for one person may not necessarily work for the other person, or they may get slightly different results. One might respond better to one lifestyle change while the other may not. Gestational diabetes is what happens. You might hear that a lot, um, particularly if you're female. And if you have been pregnant, then you have to go take a glucose tolerance test. It's quite disgusting. We drink this really bright orange serum of glucose, and then we have to wait to see if our blood sugar rises that if, if it doesn't go over a certain limit, that means that we're producing enough insulin. This is really critical because it can harm both the mother or the baby. No one knows really why it happens. If you do have um, gestational diabetes, you do have a higher chance of developing type two in life. And there are some studies that show that it's possible that your child could have a higher chance of having type two diabetes later in life. It's not a guarantee, but it's, it's very interesting how all of this works together. So gestational is something to be aware of because it, it can happen. It can happen frequently. Typically, it will leave after the pregnancy, but sometimes it might linger around and turn into type 2 diabetes. So I want to bust a few myths after having told you a little bit about the types of diabetes and showing you some pictures of what diabetes look like. People with diabetes cannot eat sugar. That's not entirely true. And it's very interesting how we got to this place where we only put that in the context of people that have diabetes. What this should say is all people, regardless of if they have diabetes or not, should watch how much sugar they eat and be careful. 
Now, of course, if you do have diabetes and you eat a lot of sugar, your body's going to have a more challenging time to digest it. So you do have to have insulin if you need it. It should be a part of a balanced diet. And if you're not taking insulin, then, you know, whatever it is that your doctor or your medical team tells you to do to balance it, you need to be really careful with that. So you do have to take some precautions, but I'm not going to sit here and say that only people with diabetes cannot eat sugar because the reality is we all should be very careful with what we're putting into our bodies. There's a lot of conscious and unconscious bias that people with diabetes brought this upon themselves. And we don't even realize it sometimes. And I say we, because I used to be guilty of that as well. When my son was diagnosed with type one, I went through this phase. I, I, I say every parent, when your child gets a chronic condition, no matter what it is, you do go through a kind of a grief cycle. And I think as part of my process of digesting it, I was angry with people that had type two for a while, just for a couple of weeks, because I thought, why would someone do this to themselves? But the more I learned about diabetes, the more I realized that that was very wrong. Nobody, nobody stands up and says, hey, I want diabetes. Nobody brings it upon themselves. There's a lot of th things that happen in someone's life. A lot of things about the way food is marketed that makes people eat a lot of processed food that might've contributed to their diabetes. There's so many factors. No one has brought diabetes upon themselves. Obesity causes diabetes. Yes, if you are overweight or clinically obese, you do have a higher chance of getting diabetes, but, you, but the two are not mutually exclusive. Like I mentioned earlier, I've had some very thin, very healthy people in my, come up to me or come into my life that, that have diabetes and they are not obese. So it's not mutually exclusive. Diet or special foods cure diabetes. If you go to the internet and you search for the cure for diabetes, you're probably not gonna find all the clinical kind of stem cell research and other exciting things that are happening. You'll find pictures of cinnamon and formulas for okra water and a lot of other things. Some people do eat cinnamon or other things and people with type two or mild insulin resistance might notice some changes, but not everyone. No two people with diabetes are alike. To this day, cinnamon has not cured anyone having diabetes. They may have had better blood sugar results, but a lot of those are anecdotal experiences. If cinnamon or a special food or some of the things I've been told, someone told me they could cure my son with meditation. Um, if any of that worked, be sure I would have done it a long time ago. And not just me, all the other, about, there's about a million children, a million plus children in the world uh, with type one diabetes. So a million plus families would have been injecting cinnamon by now if it worked. People with diabetes face discrimination. We don't realize it, but they do. And it can happen in the workplace. Um, sometimes, you know, it depends on how much people disclose about their health conditions. People don't always understand diabetes. People sometimes think it's an excuse if someone's having a challenging day with it. I know when I used to work in the corporate world, I was a couple of times openly discriminated against because I was the mom and a caretaker of a child with a chronic condition. And a couple of times I had to leave early for a urgent uh, issue with my child's insulin pump or some other things related to diabetes. And people openly said that that was wrong. Someone told me they wished that they had had a child with diabetes or that they wished they had diabetes so they could leave work early. So discrimination in the workplace is sadly alive and well. And I highlight this simply because the more that I talk about diabetes and educate people about diabetes and what that really means, I hope to be part of that solution where people think twice before they might say something that they think is kind of funny in a really dark way. There's nothing funny about it when you're, when you're struggling. Another misconception is that thin people don't get diabetes. 
This is a, a modern day supermodel, if you will. This is actually a picture of Kate Moss's daughter. If any of you are familiar with that name, she was a very popular model in the 1990s, I guess. I wasn't even aware that Kate Moss had a daughter until I saw this picture of her about a month ago. If you look on her left leg, she's got this white thing on her leg. That is a medical device. Uh, it's a brand called Omnipod. That is an insulin pump. This woman has type one diabetes and she is not overweight. And I love how she is owning it. She's wearing it. I think it was maybe Paris fashion week or some big fashion show. I forget this designer. If you're into fashion, you'd probably guess it right away by the look of it. Um, I just love how she's owning it. And of course the diabetes world went crazy happy over this because it was a beautiful representation of what diabetes looks like today. So what are the signs of diabetes? If you know someone that has diabetes, then you may have experienced this before. The first and foremost telling sign is that you are thirsty all the time. You have an unquenchable thirst and you make frequent trips to the toilet because one, your body is wanting so much water to try to flush that glucose out of your system that it can't digest because you're not making enough insulin. And of course, you're going to go to the toilet a lot because again, your body's flushing out all the water and trying to flush out the um, glucose that you can't, you can't get rid of, that you can't digest. For children, they often will wet the bed. And these first three were signs for my son. He had just started to learn to toilet train. He was kind of going backwards in that and starting to wet the bed. And he was a, a child that got toilet training from the beginning and just, you know, kept moving forward. And then suddenly he started going back. And the, the water drinking was highlighted to me by our helper. I was working a lot. I was a healthcare consultant. And of course I was paying attention to my child, but she's like, I think, I just feel like he's drinking too much water. And I said, well, it's Dubai and it's August. Let's measure it. So the one day that we did measure the first day, in addition to everything else he was drinking, milk and whatever it was, he had a liter and a half of water before, within a few hours before I came home from work. So that was a red flag. Fortunately, I had a little bit of an idea about what diabetes was and, you know, what that meant. And then that raised a red flag and I, I went to get him checked the next day. And the doctor thought I was kind of crazy for asking. I said, do you think he could be type one? He said, no, nah, you don't have a family history. You're all healthy. He's healthy. He's growing. I said, yeah, but he's drinking water and he's going to the toilet too much. And he said, I'll check his, his blood sugar if it'll give you peace of mind. Since that day, I never had peace of mind. My son's blood sugar read, I think it was like 640. It should be around 100. So he was clearly, clearly diabetic. Of course, pre additional tests were done to make sure that um, he was diabetic and confirm it. But I kind of knew. So either for yourself or for your children, if you have an instinct that says push a little harder and get it checked, don't be afraid to ask because that's life-saving. Your intuition is not wrong in often in these cases. And if it's a, if it's a simple test, like a finger prick, that's not going to cause anyone any harm, then, then do it and better just to get checked. And then if it's not diabetes, then you can explore other options with your doctor of what might be causing these things. Other signs, extreme hunger. And this is not like your blood sugar's going high and your body's craving something. Your body is craving insulin and the need to get your blood sugar down, but sometimes people with high blood sugar will tend to overeat. It's like when you're really, really tired and then you'll eat, but your body really needs sleep because your body's feeling like it needs something, but you don't know what that is. Weight loss, people with high blood sugar lose a lot of weight very quickly. Some feel angry or have mood swings. High blood sugar can do that. Not, not everybody has that. My son didn't really have that that I noticed. He was quite small. And even now, if he has high blood sugar, not too often does he have a mood swing, but it can happen in a lot of people. Definitely, you'll feel tired and weak because your body is not functioning at its best. 
high blood sugars or higher blood sugars, let's say you have insulin resistance and you don't have the extreme high blood sugar in the case of a type one, which is a medical emergency and has to be treated right away. If you've been avoiding checkups and you have elevated blood sugar and insulin resistance over time, it's going to make you feel really tired just because your body is not performing at its optimal level of blood sugar. Your vision will become blurry. That's often the first complication that happens um, with blood sugar over time because it affects the nerves behind the eyes that affect our eyesight. So that's why you might often hear or read on the internet that blindness can be an issue for people with diabetes. Getting checked for glaucoma annually is very, very important. You need to have your doctor, your eye doctor, look behind your eyes to make sure that your blood vessels are doing okay. Super important. High blood sugar, especially in type ones, will cause a fruity smell on the breath. This is from what they call ketones in the blood. Ketones are basically acid in your blood. When you have too much glucose in your blood, that turns to acid. And that is what becomes deadly. It induces vomiting and it's often mistaken for flu because you've lost weight, you're tired, you're moody, you look awful and you're vomiting. Those are like the signs of flu. And so this is why type one diagnosis are often overlooked. For type two diabetes, typically type two is caught during checkups. It's not really getting to the point where you're in a, a DKA as they call it, diabetes ketoacidosis, where you have a lot of acid in your blood and a lot of ketones. Type two is typically caught when someone goes for a checkup suspecting they might have type two or they're just getting an annual regular checkup and they have slightly elevated blood sugar. And that's why it's super important for all of us to get checkups. Type one diabetes is diagnosed in adults. It's happening more and more throughout the years and no one is sure why. Type one diabetes used to be considered only for children, but adults can get type one as well. And because they are adults and doctors themselves even think this is only a children's disease, it can be misdiagnosed, which in turn is mistreated. Until you get the proper diagnosis and the, the proper treatment, you're not going to feel great. Oh, sorry. And one very last important thing that I want to say is there is absolutely no shame in having diabetes. There is no reason to ever feel embarrassed or ashamed. It's a manageable condition. And I put this out there because I talk about diabetes a lot in this part of the world, in the Middle East, in the GCC. And it is not unusual for particularly locals um, and Arabs to disclose when they have a medical issue. I think in the West, I'm from the US and you know, things have evolved, maybe not necessarily for the better all the time. And people are very quick to be very open and, and talk about what they have. And sometimes in a way that's not even really comfortable or professional or appropriate, but if you have diabetes, that doesn't mean that you're broken or that you're less of a person. And this is why the discrimination issue that I discussed is so important. We shouldn't discriminate and you should not be discriminated against, but never be ashamed of it. It's just like wearing glasses. Not exactly the same. It requires a lot more work, but we don't go around shaming people that wearing glasses, that, that wear glasses. So we shouldn't go around shaming people that, that need insulin. So what can you do? Maybe you have diabetes. Maybe you, you might have parents that have diabetes and you're worried about getting it. And yes, genetics is a big component of it, but what we do in our everyday lives and our environment and what we try to take control over can really impact our genes. I don't wanna say we can reverse it, but we can really fight against what we have programmed in our genes with doing some basic things in our environment, in our everyday life. Uh, this was in here earlier in the month. So what we did this month at Diapoint, we had what was called the Diapoint November Challenge. And this was a free for anybody that wanted to sign up and join us. We did a comprehensive health and well-being tracker um, with webinars and motivation. And it, it was all analog because we wanted people to really get engaged in their health, getting people to set goals and do different things. And the tips that I'm going to show you, this is what we had people set the goals around. And these are all based on science and things that support overall health 
and managing diabetes. So the first one, of course, people always think when they think of high blood sugar, one of the first things people think of is exercise. It's super important. If you have diabetes, of course, if you're active and moving around, even if it's just walking, that is going to help with your blood sugar. That's why our watches, our smart watches, you know, they'll give you the notification. It's time to stand up, take a walk, move around. It does help. I personally, myself, am someone that I hate counting steps. I once worked out with a trainer and they made me track steps and I hated it, but it's really true. If you do try to hit that 10,000 steps a day, and that's another story. Why is it 10,000? That's another webinar. Um, I don't want to take time away from this one, but it, the more active you are, the better results that you will have with your blood sugar. Diabetes and mental health. It's so important to look after our mental health. We need to be, I don't want to say as stress-free as possible because life has stress. Stress can be also used for good, but we want to take time out for ourselves and our health. Taking time out to exercise is actually an act of caring for yourself and taking a break for your mental health. It's critical. If, and if you're really struggling and having a really hard time with something, diabetes or something else otherwise, ask for help, get support. Whether that's if you're trying to achieve some health goals that maybe your doctor and health team set out for you, you've been struggling with, maybe it's just something around positive psychology and coaching that you need to get a little accountability and a little direction. Or if there's something bigger that you've been struggling with for a very long time, then maybe it's the support of a psychologist or a psychiatrist that you want to seek out. But our mental health is critical to our blood sugars. There's about 60 or so things that affect blood sugars. Stress and anxiety and not feeling well mentally is one of them. I see it in my son on his blood sugar numbers all the time. If he's stressed out about something and if he's really, really stressed out, the, the, the higher his stress level, the higher his blood sugar is. And it makes it very difficult for it to come down. Sleep. Sleep is... Of all the things I'm going to tell you, it is the easiest thing that we can do, and it's one of the most important things that we can do. The average adult needs around eight hours of sleep every night, and honestly, most of us don't get that. I don't get it. I don't get eight hours of sleep, and that's uninterrupted, really good, really beautiful sleep. I had some personal experience with this a couple of years ago, just before COVID, I decided to start, I needed to really get back into my own health and exercise. So I started to work out with a personal trainer. This is the one that made me track my steps that I didn't enjoy. I'm not even kidding on the nights when I would sleep well, and if I had enough water to drink as well the day, I would wake up the next morning and I would lose like a kilo. Sleep contributes to weight loss. It contributes to our health. And recent studies have found that sleep apnea, people that have trouble sleeping or they're not getting good sleep, have insulin resistance. So sometimes that's why if you go to the doctor and you have insulin resistance, a doctor that's up to date on the research and statistics, one of the first questions that they might ask you is, how is your sleep? And this is why, because we're learning more and more about the importance of sleep all the time and it affects everything. Nutrition is obvious uh, when it comes to diabetes and anything really, not just diabetes. Like my son is going to remember me when I'm gone from this world as saying, my mom always said, diabetic or not, nobody needs to have bad nutrition. Nobody needs to eat donuts every day. I have nothing against donut companies. Sorry if anyone here is working for one. Everything in moderation we need to eat as well as we can. And what does that mean? One, everything in moderation, not a lot of processed foods. Avoid as many processed foods if you can. I mentioned earlier in my presentation that plant-based is best. These are all based on science and the study of lifestyle medicine and research, and they have been tested. And it's been actually quite since the early 1900s that Research was coming out about the effects of 
animal fat and meat and cholesterol. There wasn't a lot of research around diabetes and things at the time. I found it for, in my son, to be honest, um, red meat causes a lot of insulin resistance for him. That's because our body's digestion, the way it works, we have to break down the protein and the fat first before our body can get to the carbohydrates. So let's say you don't have type one diabetes, but your body is working so, so hard to digest that food. And if by the time the digestion process comes to the part where it's breaking down the carbs, you may not have made enough insulin to address that. I see it with the timing of when I give my son his insulin. Not every person with diabetes has insulin resistance, um, but it, it is something to look into and maybe test yourself on yourself if you're having insulin resistance. If you love meat, try not to maybe eat it at dinner, eat it earlier in the day so that you're not just going to go to bed and sleep right after having the meat. And this is a little bit provocative and not what people maybe in 2021 want to hear, but the keto diet is scientifically proven not to be really great for long-term health outcomes. Yes, it will help you lose weight, but because it's, if you're doing a keto diet that's heavy, heavily dependent on meat and animal products, it, it might cause you problems later down the road. And, and one of those could be high cholesterol and possibly some insulin resistance. Hydration, I mentioned water. After sleep, this is the most critical thing. We all know our bodies are made up of water. It's so important that we're hydrated. If we're taking medication like insulin, our body absorbs it better when we're hydrated. All those cells in our body need water constantly. So even if you drank enough, if you think you drank enough, drink more. How do you know if you're hydrated? An easy test, honestly, if your urine is clear, unless you're taking medication or vitamins or a supplement, then that's going to turn your urine yellow. But by the time after, if you're not taking it throughout the day, later in the day, you want your urine to be clear. If your urine is not clear and it's not because of a vitamin, drink some more water. So when it comes to corporate wellness, how can you make such things successful? Of course, these are things that you can do yourself, but if you're thinking about this in the context of corporate wellness, I just want to leave you with a few thoughts. If you want to do something like this within your company, then make sure you include everyone, not just a certain group of people. And it's very hard to get companies to embrace this. Why? Because you don't see the, the value on the bottom line. It doesn't affect your sales directly. It's quite an indirect added value. What, what, what is the added value? It's maybe you'll have less people calling in sick. Um, you know, more people are present at work. There's a lot of different ways that you can measure added value, but it's a long-term game. Health, health in general is a long-term game. It's not something that you're gonna see the change immediately overnight. And I think this is why a lot of people stop because it is long and it needs a lot of support and it needs a lot of accountability. It has to be authentic. If you're doing it just because it's kind of trendy or sometimes things get handed down from the corporate top in another country and if it's not relatable and if it's not gonna feel authentic, then people are not gonna be very quick to embrace it. I think that's true for everything. Leadership has to be involved. Because if leadership isn't embracing it, then it won't feel authentic and people aren't going to believe into it. And also you might want to hire professionals to support your initiatives because within the corporate, we know everyone is already overwhelmed with all the initiatives and everything that they have to do. And if you went to your HR or whichever department that you would designate to manage a corporate wellness program and said to them, you're going to roll this out for 10,000 people across MIA. And they're going to be like, what? So having an extra set of hands, it, there's no harm in that. And you'll set yourself up for success and you'll have someone solely dedicated to that. And that will really help your employees embrace it as well. The results that you might get, improved health and habits for sure. Less absenteeism, which I mentioned. Improvements in safety you might find that it can be different things. It can be you know, through, throughout the office. It can be in personal health. There's so many areas that improve. You'll have better performance and productivity because for sure when we're eating well, feeling our best, 
our brains are engaged. We're ready to go. We're much more positive. We're much more optimistic. You'll have a lower turnover rate. It's really hard to keep people um, in, in the, in organizations these days for many reasons. Sometimes, you know, they always talk about the gap between there was Gen X and then millennials and then Gen Z, and they all want different things. But I truly believe, and I've seen it, that if people feel that they're being looked after and cared for, they're not so quick to jump from company to company. You know, the, uh, the offspring of all of this is it will improve your customer quality and satisfaction because your employees will be much happier, they'll be much more energetic, and they'll just want to do better, and that results in better service. Fewer injuries, which results in the second one, fewer insurance claims fewer chronic conditions, fewer insurance claims, that is a cost saving right there. Fewer sick days, as I mentioned, and also lower workers comp. If you see a lot of that, you might wanna look at how corporate wellness can support some of the repeating issues that you might be having if you're getting a lot of workers comp. So that concludes my presentation. Um, please feel free to reach out anytime if you have any questions. And you can find me, that's, that's my email, um, directly, comes directly to me. You can reach out there. You can follow us on social media, Diapoint Arabia or Diapoint Arabia. That is our Arabic channel. And you can find us in Facebook, Twitter, all of those in English and Arabic. Um, also, you can find me on LinkedIn. So thank you so much for listening today. If you have any questions, um, please let me know. I'd, I'd love to hear them. Um, thank you so much for your talk and for making this talk very real, I think. Um, and thanks for sharing your story about your son, because I think it just made diabetes very relatable. Um, and I'm happy to hear that diabetes brought Star Wars. I thought that was a great story. So thanks so much for sharing. Thank you. And yeah, and for breaking down a lot of the uh, taboos around diabetes. Certainly, um, I for one have learned a lot. So I see Abby has a question. I'm just going to unmute you, Abby, now so you can uh, ask Pamela your question. I think maybe Abby, or you can unmute yourself. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, actually, I um I was just trying to clap for you because I thought it was a really good uh, discussion, um, and I think it's it just kind of opens up the eyes a lot. I think you debunked a lot of the myths that uh, even that I had. You know, I thought I thought I understood it better than I did. So, thanks for that. And um, yeah, I'm I'm more I'm really interested in kind of the wellness side. So, Catherine, maybe you and I we can have a chat offline on this, and then Absolutely. figure out what's the best way to to uh, to support so thank you thank you thank you for your feedback i really appreciate it that really means a lot to me um because i i do i try to keep these real and you know i don't want to scare people with how real diabetes can be but after having managed this in my child for about 12 11 or 12 years now and he's slowly doing more things on his own but the misconceptions and even within the medical community, like some things that even some doctors think that aren't specialized in diabetes, it was just mind boggling to me. And that's what made me want to start really doing this and talking about it because it is so much more than just the sound bites and information that we get. So thank you so much for your kind words. Thank you. Thanks, Abby. Thanks, Pam. Um, actually, one of my colleagues, Nick, is here with me and he has a question. Nick. Oh, hi, hi Nick. Hi, Pam. Thanks for joining. Um, more, more for the audience, I suppose, um, around the discrimination piece. As someone who suffers from type 1 diabetes and has done for quite a long time, what's the one piece of advice that you'll be giving your son to help him manage the perception of others so he can speak up? Oh, that I would be giving my son? Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's a great question. Honestly, since he was young and, and very small, and for example, when he was kind of five, six years old and children, you know, would come up and ask him about his insulin pump and very innocently, because kids are curious, right? And like, hey, what do you got in there? Is that carrots? Is that your snack? It was the adults that asked the more like bizarre question, but I think I've always, even in the most difficult times, try to parent or lead 
in the way that I would want him to respond. And that is, we are very matter of fact about diabetes and we are never ashamed about having diabetes. And I've always just taught him to, he's never really faced discrimination because for him, he's just always had it. And I've always taught him to be kind of proud of it. You know, you don't have to be out there like in your face and say like, oh, I have diabetes. But if it comes down to it and you're in a situation and someone's trying to call it out or use it against you, then mm -hmm. just stand up and be bold, just like you would for anything else. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's it. And, you know, I can say at least for now, he's, like I said, almost 14. As a teenager, the things that are bothering him are typical teenage things and nothing around diabetes. And I hope that that continues to be the case. If he's in a workplace situation and he was getting discriminated against, I would say just like anything you need to go, number one, find like, if it's continuous, who is the ally that can really support you? you we all need champions for whatever it is that we're doing, especially the hard things like this. And ask for objective advice and ask for them to help champion you. If necessary, start a movement around it. Like November is a perfect month to, you know, while we have diabetes all day, every day, when, if it's, you know, close to November or start a movement around it to get people to become more aware of it and slowly start breaking down those barriers. Those are, those are the few, a few of the things that come to mind. But I always say, you know, be proud of it. It doesn't define you and it's not 100% who you are, but it's, it's a part of you. Does that answer the question? Yeah, oh, sorry. I thought I was on mute. Um, <laughs> yes, thank you very much. I, 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 I tend to I agree that um, it's about not looking at diabetes as a disease, but as an opportunity mm -hmm. um, to share your story and actually own something um, and make a difference. Yeah, it's a condition. That's what I always say. And I often now find myself correcting people when they're like, oh, it's this disease. And I'm like, it's a condition. Um, so, yeah, I'm open to any suggestions, though, that you might have for the future. <laughs> and I, I have one more question, actually, um, around, and, and this may not exist because some of the things that you've talked about already, and I think it's more for any listeners that have young children with diabetes. I, I agree very much that it's about communication and community that's probably the biggest issue, not necessarily the diabetes itself. And how is your son managing that peer pressure? Because there are some things as diabetics you can't be overzealous with. And I just wondered how is he managing that peer pressure if it, if it even exists? Um, around fast foods, for example, or around poor nutrition and poor diets and things like that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think for adults, that's an excellent question too, because there is so much peer pressure. The office party, actually my podcast that I have a podcast. So if you want to learn more about diabetes and actually I got the opportunity to interview Nick as well, which was amazing. But if you want to learn more about diabetes and health and wellness, then you can listen to the Diet Point podcast. The episode that's dropping this Wednesday is about how to manage around the holidays. And the advice just isn't for people with diabetes. It's advice that we all need to take. When it comes to managing the peer pressure, from a very young age, uh, I decided for my son that, yes, I wanted him to participate and be just like every other kid. However, my husband and I are pretty healthy. I've always been healthy. When I was young, growing up in the 70s, my parents were all into organic gardening before that was a thing. And talking about, you know, not using pesticides and all this other stuff before it, it just, it became a thing. So we've always lived really healthy. His type one came to me as a shock because not understanding what causes it. Like I was that mom making all the organic baby food and doing all, all the things. However, I was also that mom that said like, you know, hey, if you're gonna have like this kind of, you know, maybe we'll be out eating something and you wanna eat something bad or you're going to a birthday party and having a slice of cake, that is okay. But you're not having cake every day. You're not having donuts every day. Although there was a time before COVID when I was just like, 
my, my head was going to explode because it felt like donuts were coming in for birthdays to school every other day. And I'm like, what is this teaching our kids? Right. So for the peer pressure for children and adults as well, I say, enjoy those things, but don't make that the center of your diet. And I don't even like the term diet. I don't mean that in the negative connotation. Don't make it the center of your nutrition. As long as 80 to 90%, or it should be 90% or more of what you're eating is healthy, then you will in general probably be okay. Now, of course, if he goes to a birthday party and there's cake and all this other junk food there, it took a couple of years to learn how to really manage that blood sugar. But we finally got to the point where he knows what to do. He knows how to, to give insulin. I cooked a very large Thanksgiving dinner last week for 20 people. And I am all about Thanksgiving. I cook very healthy. I, I use less sugar and do all these things. But still, at the end of the day, there's a fair amount of carbs on the table. It's not processed food necessarily, but pecan pie, you need a little bit of sugar in that or a little bit of maple syrup, you know. Um, and I was so impressed at the, I didn't ask him once. I just kind of asked him one time, like, how's your blood sugar? He said, fine. And he had a beautiful straight line at the end of the night. So he's learned how to navigate it. So I think the advice for peer pressure is you don't have to give into it. There, it's, it's your diet, your body. You eat what you want, but you know how to manage it after. Be aware of the consequences and make sure that you're not eating like that all the time. Because like, if you talk to Aaron, he'll be like, oh yeah, my mom always says diabetic or not. Nobody needs to be eating that every day. And he's like, oh, mom. And then, and then I, I would teach him how to make healthy choices. When he was young, I was the mom that would send the fruit plate to the party. Fruit has, you know, sugar and carbs in it, but everybody else wanted to send cookies and juice. Juice is such a big misconception that it's healthy when it has really no more, no less sugar than a, than a, you know, soft drink. Um, so he's like, mom, can't you just send like something unhealthy for once? People think you're doing it because I'm diabetic. So that was kind of a peer pressure thing, right? And nobody said anything to him, but he felt that. He felt kind of ashamed around always being the healthy kid because we pack very well-balanced um, meals and things. And I said, this isn't just for you. This is for everyone because I think you understand how to eat healthy, but the other kids aren't really sure about it. So just everything in moderation, learn how to navigate it. Um, when it comes to peer pressure, you, you don't, you don't have to give in. You don't have to be so rigid and hard on yourself either. If you do want to explore having a piece of cake once a month. Great answer, Pam. And I think, um, I think as you say, it's not just for, for children, it's for adults as well. And, and for people who are not diabetic, certainly. And there's a lot of lessons to have been learned, even around, you spoke about mental health and you spoke about sleep. I mean, there's so much connected um, and so much to be aware of. So I think you really made this, this whole webinar very real and very uh, relatable for people. And um, so thanks, thanks for bringing that um, to us and bringing all this really interesting information. Um, I don't see any more questions. Um, if anybody does have a question for Pam, just before we finish up, if you want to put up your hand, as I said at the start, unfortunately, we lost our text box. Um, but if anybody has any questions before we go, I don't see anybody. Um, Pam, just again, big thank you. Um, look forward to working with you more in the future. Thank you. Um, and thank I love you. that. Yeah, I really look forward to it. Um, and thanks for everybody for joining. Um, really appreciate that. That's your time as well. So yeah, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you all for joining and have a lovely rest of the year and happy holidays. Enjoy the weekend. Take thank care. Thank you too. All the best. Bye. Bye.